Hello everyone and welcome. Hello, this is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. Welcome to tonight's presentation. We are going to be doing a tour of the night sky and this is for September. We're in 2020 and I'm so excited you're going to be joining us tonight. We're actually going to be joined by two more people. <laughs> We're going to be going through all the cool things you'll be able to see with either a pair of binoculars or with your naked eyes just by looking, going outside, looking up and you'll totally understand what you're looking at after tonight's session. Now, if you're new to the uh, the CCAS, Central Coast Astronomical Society. Um, we're just a group of astronomers that are passionate about the night skies and we love sharing it with others. And so this is just a special free presentation that we do once a month. And so I'm super excited that you're gonna be joining us uh, tonight. Now there's a few little quick things I wanted to just point out and make sure so you'll get the most out of our session together. Um, the first thing is that if you have a question anytime during this presentation tonight, there's a couple of ways that you can ask the question. Now the first way is you can type it into the chat box. So if you're connecting through YouTube, you'll see a chat box under the screen. You feel free to type your questions in anytime. Now the cool thing about that is that chat box is actually being monitored and watched by lots of different astronomers. Brian is going to be on that as well. You'll meet him in just a minute. Uh, but also other astronomers from the Astronomy Club as well will be helping answer your questions. And the next way, in case you're not able to see the chat box or you'd prefer to do it more privately, you can send an email to questions at centralcoastastronomy.org, O-R-G, or you can text, don't call, nobody's there. <laughs> you can text your question to the number that you see at the bottom of the screen. Do you see it right there? So right here, you wanna go ahead and test. Um, you can go ahead and um, text in that, uh, your questions to that as well. We'll be um, doing the question and answer at the end of the presentation for tonight. So, um, but we'll try to answer your questions. And also, if you could just go ahead and let us know if the audio's looking well, if the video's looking well, go ahead and just drop me a quick comment. Also, let us know where you're connecting from. Astronomically speaking, it'll help us figure out what we should be talking about tonight. Now, I already know what most of what we're gonna talk about tonight, but we'll throw in some extras as well if we can do that. So um, go ahead and just let us know what part of the world that you're connecting with, and so we can stay, uh, we can, know where, um, where you're connecting from, so, oh, all right. So a couple other little quick things um, before I introduce you to the rest of our astronomers. Um, if you have, oh, wait, sorry, wrong thing first. Okay, so this is a star chart that you can download for free, and this is from skymaps.com. So you go to skymaps.com, download it, whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, and this is how we're gonna be looking at the night sky. Now, this a lot of information on here it can be really confusing. So I recommend taking a highlighter or a pencil with you. Now, again, if you, if you don't have this, don't worry. You can, you can always do this later. Um, but if how I would do this is we're going to be covering several constellations tonight and asterisms. And so as we go through, you can circle them, make some notes as we go along so you'll have a really good visual of that. And how this thing is supposed to work, in case you've never figured this out, it, it's not obvious at all. Um, but you'll see really in small print, there's north and west and south and east. And the idea is, is that you put this over your head and this is what the night sky looks like. And so by putting it over your head, you align the north with the north and the south with the south and all that. Um, and then you'll be able to look up and you're like, oh, 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 I get it. Okay, and so over here is Hercules. Oh, and you look up and that's the star pattern up there. So that's kind of a little quick introduction. Uh, so you can go ahead and get that out as well. The other thing is we had a couple of questions about equipment. Now on the, uh, uh oh, do I not have a copy of it? I should have a copy of it. Um, I put together, I put together a copy of something I can't find. Um, there is a download for tonight's presentation and it's about a 12 page document. On the last page are equipment recommendations for telescopes, for binoculars. So if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and check that out. Um, I talked about the Cometrons uh, binoculars in there as well as the ultra views from Orion as well as um, the giant ones, which I'll talk to you about later. Um, if you're looking for books, this is a really good one, Touring the Universe Through Binoculars. It's an older one, so you'd be able to get it just for five or ten bucks from a used bookstore online. Um, but Touring the Universe Through Binoculars um, by Philip Harrington. This is a good one to get started. And if you participated in the moon class we did last month, um, this is one of the reference books that was recommended as well. The moon is a really great object to, to look at with the night sky. Okay. Oh, here it is. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is the printout that I put together and Kent and I are going to walk through this tonight. This is what we're going to be covering tonight. I did leave some space in the margins so you can um, mark it up like I've done here. And so we're going to be going through this tonight and uh, so you get a better idea of what we're going to be covering. Okay. Phew. Did I cover everything, Brian? Did I get it all? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we still have eight more. Um, we have two more minutes. Okay, so let me go ahead. So if you haven't already said hello, hi, my name's Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. And I'm so excited you're here with us tonight. Any questions during the presentation? Uh, use the link below. This is going to go away during our presentation. So make sure you write down that number, write down the email address. Um, if you can't see it because it's too small, um, uh, I'll read out the phone number in just a minute so you can write that down. Okay, so definitely grab a pencil and a piece of paper. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is Kent at some point in our presentation tonight, the astronomer that we're going to have on our tour tonight, he's going to be talking about this. And this is the Skygazer's Almanac. This is available for four or five dollars from um, Sky and Telescope. It's a really cool way of looking at all the objects in the night sky at a glance. You know, when you can use apps, and you know, I use Sky Safari and Stellarium. Um, those are great, but they only give you an instant zoomed in shot of just what's happening right there. And so what's really neat about this is it shows you a progression throughout the year. So we have January, February, March, April, May, June, June, the nights are short. So we have a little squeezed in section here, July, all to, to December. And the time goes across here. This is sunset all the way to midnight, all the way to sunrise. So the nights are longer in December, shorter in the summer. And each of these vertical lines here represents um, the where the planets are. And you can kind of see at a glance how things change throughout the year. So it's really cool. So that's something that you can look at as well. And I actually have a step-by-step -step video that shows you how to read that thing. So you don't have to worry about doing it tonight. All right, should we get started, Brian? What do you think? <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and introduce our team to you. If you are ready to go, just go ahead and give me an, oh yeah, this is gonna be so much fun oh, tonight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 he's over here. He's this disembodied voice. Get over here, get over here. <laughs> this is my husband, Al. <laughs> and he is the reason I'm into astronomy. He actually got me my first telescope when I was, uh, what, maybe 15 years ago? And he yeah. took it apart. He put the motor drive in the dryer and he put the tripod in the dishwasher and he made this treasure hunt and I had to go around the house putting it all together. I didn't even know all the parts I needed. <laughs> so, so thank you for all the inspiration. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All right, so he's going to be <laughs> behind the scenes helping out as we go through tonight as well. But let me introduce you to our astronomers. Brian, are you there? Let's do you first. Let me um, unmute you and share you with our with our viewers. <laughs> Hang on just a second. I have to. Um, You're on a full screen. I have to full there. screen. I'm here. Yes, you are here. Hang on a second. And. Let me see if I can, um, no, I didn't do that right. I'm sorry, hang on, hang on, hang on. I wanna make you, I wanna spotlight your spotlight. video. That's what I wanna do. There we go. Okay, looking good, good. Okay, hang on, hang on, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> We're using kind of a complicated system tonight. I don't know if you can tell. Here we go, so here's Brian. Hi, Brian. All right, hello. <laughs> Why don't you tell us um, just something like 60 seconds about you, what uh, astronomy yeah, club you're I'm, with, what you have. All right. Hello. Sorry, I gotta, I'm got i listening to the Zoom and the YouTube, which has a delay, so I need to make sure. All right. Awesome. Well, I'm with Central Coast Astronomical, and I'm actually also with with Riverside Astronomical down here in Southern California. I've been into amateur astronomy, oh, since, uh, since I was 16 years old. And I just, uh, one of my favorite things with astronomy is sharing it with others. So I really appreciate this opportunity to join you, Al and Kent and everyone online to just uh, explore the night sky, even though it's a virtual tour tonight. We encourage everyone to take notes and then you send you all out if you have clear skies tonight or hopefully sometime soon. So thanks and I look forward to tonight. Awesome, thank you. And now we're gonna go ahead and say hello to Kent. Kent, are you there? Yeah, I'm there, Ryan, or Aurora. Hi, 
can't. I, I'm I'm kind of handicapped because there's like over a two or three minute delay on the uh, YouTube video. I'm trying to redo it. <laughs> oh no! But but uh, you know I, I don't think I'm going to look at the screen. I'm just going to go over the phone there. Okay. Okay. No problem. Okay, so, um, Kent, I've got a picture of you at a stargazing party here. You're sitting down looking at some star charts. I've got a picture that I'm showing everyone here. Do um, you want to give us a little 60-second intro to your equipment and how and usually your background? At, okay, yeah. Us usually at the star parties, I haul my 20-inch. Uh, it's a 20-inch star splitter. It has no drive. You just push it around. It's a Dobsonian. Uh, has a big mirror, so it's a reflector. And the star chart I'm probably looking at is Sky Atlas 2000. It's like, you know, the best starting point. Uh, if you have like an 8-inch or something like that, it's really useful. As long as you know your way around the constellations, it's really helpful. And so I usually put that on my little foldable table there. Oh, pardon, what was that? Um, usually I'm looking through, uh, well, I'm looking through the finder scope. I have an 8 by 50 straight through finder scope on the 20 inch. So usually we're looking out there for something bright initially because it's still light out. So you, right now you'd be looking for Jupiter or Saturn. And so... Basically, you line up your finder scope with your eyepiece and get those two in sync. So when you look through your finder scope and it's in the center of your finder scope, you also look through the eyepiece, make sure that the object is in the center of your eyepiece. Awesome. And, you know, you didn't always used to have a telescope this big, right? You, you had an orange one. Oh, that's my C8. Yeah. Yeah, I used to use that until I got the 20-inch. And so don't I don't use the C8 that much any longer, but the uh, the 20 inch is a pain <laughs> in terms of being a big scope to tear down mm -hmm. and put together. And so, but it, the views are pretty awesome. Awesome, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our tour of the night sky. I'm going to go ahead and bring up a planetarium software that I'm going to be using for tonight. Oh, I forgot to mention also, for those of you who've just joined us, this is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. And if you have questions during this presentation, please just type them in the comment box. If you don't have that ability, there are two other ways to do it. Um, go ahead and write this down because this screen's about to go away. You can type in your questions to questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. So questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. Or you can text the number that's at the bottom. Don't call it, nobody's there. You can text your questions. The number, I'll read it twice in case it's too small to see, 805 242 6415. So 805 242 6415. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our tour of the night sky. Give me just a second to get everything set up here. Hang on just a second. Okay. All right, Kent, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. So what's the first thing we want to talk about tonight? How about the moon? The moon will be a good one, and there may be a little crescent over into the west this evening, but it's going to be down kind of low since it's only two days afterwards. But there should be something out there if you have a good western horizon. There we go. I actually don't. There it is. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Oh, and for those of you who um, have not been with us before, uh, there, there is, we do our best, but there will be a delay. Kent is really just sitting there listening on the phone, talking. He has no star charts in front of him. He just, in fact, when we went through the notes on what we were gonna do tonight, he actually said, actually, Aurora, that's wrong. Wiki is wrong. Let me give you the right information. So all the information that's in here is as accurate as you can get. He actually went down back to, 
previously pub um, the original publication papers to look at that information. So Kent is just this wealth of knowledge. He's just absolutely amazing. Um, and so feel free to pepper him with questions <laughs> so we can get those answered for you. But I just want to let you know, so the information in here is just amazing. Okay, so going back, going back. Okay, so we have a two-day-old moon. Really good for stargazing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the moon can be a, you know, fairly good-sized crescent, and it won't interfere that much uh, with your observing. You know, when it starts getting large, like, a, you know, a quarter moon or, yeah, the first quarter, uh, that can start bothering you. And definitely when it's full, it's horrible. I can't even star hop because I can't see enough stars. But, you know, if you've got, got a crescent up there that's going to set in a couple hours, that's, you know, that won't be that bad. Awesome. Okay, great. And um, we've already got people asking about the equinox. Do you want to talk about that on September 27th? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, equinox occurs on Tuesday, uh, September 22nd. Uh, here uh, in Pacific Daylight Time, it occurs at 6.31 a.m. And equal mo equinox means equal day and night. So essentially, we're leaving summer behind and entering fall. So Sunday's going to be, or Monday will be the last full day of summer. Oh, wow. Okay, great. And um, let's see, you want to start with some planets? I mean, besides Earth. Yeah, yeah, let's go for Mars. Okay, great. Let's take a look at Mars. Go ahead. Why don't you tell us about Mars? Okay. What's so cool about Mars it? Mars will be on op. It, Mars is actually pretty good now. I uh, was up late the other night and saw it out there, so it's it's nice and bright. Uh, it's on opposition, which means it's going to be as close as it's going to get for this cycle on October 13th. Uh, the thing about Mars is you have to be patient. Uh, if you've got your telescope, Get a chair or a stool or something like that. Set yourself down and just look through the eyepiece. If you got tracking, that's even better. But if you're not tracking, you just have to recenter it every so often. And after a while, the image will get nice and sharp for maybe a second or two. And then it'll go away because we've always got seen that <laughs> interferes. We have an atmosphere. Also, Mars has an atmosphere. If there's a planetary uh, dust storm going on on Mars, forget it. All you're going to see is, you know, orangeness, and that's about it. If awesome. it's, you know, a good night and you have some good scene, you might see some dark markings, which are basalt plains uh, that the winds have blown the dust off. So you got like orange and black. If you got better scene, you might be able to see the ice caps which, you know, usually I see one or the other. Once in a while you can see both, but that doesn't happen very often. If you have a really nice night, you can actually see detail on the ice cap. I've actually seen like a canyon going into the ice wow. cap. That was at one of our star parties, and that was just an exceptional <laughs> night. And didn't, it did not last that long. No. So, um I just wanted to interject real quick how to find Mars. So we're, we're going to be bouncing, well, not bouncing, we're going to be staying in one area of the sky, but I wanted to show folks real quick here. Uh, Ken, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, the sky, and I'm showing you with this um, planetarium software. It's called Stellarian. You can download it for free. Um, Brian, I'm sure, will type in the website many times during the chat tonight. Brian, that's the first hint right there. And uh, <laughs> so um, what we're looking at here is the, I don't know if you can see it, but there's an E, this is for east, and then we have northeast and southeast. So tonight, this is set for about 10 o'clock tonight at my latitude. So you would download this program, put your latitude in, a uh, zip code really, and it will show you what's up in your particular night sky and it'll tell you where to find stuff. So if I go out at 10 o'clock tonight, look east, go up a little bit, I'm going to see an orange star, and that's going to be Mars. And so I'm going to show you how you and can it's find it. Really, yeah, go ahead. It's really, really bright now, so it, it'll it, stand out like a sore thumb. It is really in, bright. In, in yes. fact, you might be able to use Jupiter and Saturn, mm -hmm. uh, since they're both on the ecliptic. If you extend a line through them, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it might run into where Mars is. I don't know if you can open up the field enough to show. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Yes. You can see Jupiter and Saturn, they kind of point towards Mars because they're all in the ecliptic. They do, they do. So because the solar system is in a plane, here, if I show my face. Um, oh, hang on a second. Um, because um, everything is mostly more or less in a plane, that means from our perspective, we're going to see the sun tracing out a path through the sky and the moon's gonna trace out just about the same path. And then the planets are gonna trace out the same path, which is really convenient when you're looking for planets at night. So tonight, if you kind of know where the sun is arcing or you kind of notice that during the day, um, and it's going to be hard with the moon because it's so thin right now, but eventually, I mean, you kind of get a feel for what it is. And then you look in that same path, and the chances are the really bright ones are going to be the ones you'll be able to see for planets. And that includes Mercury, Saturn, and um, Jupiter for tonight. So let's take a look. Go ahead, Kent. So next one will be Mercury, which is actually pretty low right now. Uh, sometimes the... Uh, the uh, Oh, what's it called? The uh, ephemerae or uh, uh, the thing you showed for where the planets are in, you know, in one year. Almanac. That's oh, oh, what oh, it the is. Almanac? The yes. Planetary. It's an almanac. Yes. And yes. Uh, basically, you can see sometimes Mercury will have like a really big peak into the dark part of the sky. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, really nice. Unfortunately, this cycle uh, in the west there, it's going to stay in twilight. It doesn't really peak up into the dark part of the sky. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not the best uh, viewing for Mercury where, you know, sometimes you get a really nice high peak into the blackness and uh, that kind of light blue is really twilight. So it's kind of hovering around twilight. I'm sure if you have a good western horizon, and a pair of binoculars, you can probably pick it up, but it's nothing exciting. Yeah, it's going to be really low and just after sunset, and you got to look to the west, and you, got, you can't have any mountains here. <laughs> okay, and so great. we got Mercury next, you know, Jupiter and Saturn, they're like the, the real fantastic objects to see right now. Tell us about I those. Mean, they're both close to each other. Jupiter is uh, about five times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, where Saturn's about ten times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, or what they call astronomical units. Mm -hmm. uh, but over time, next year, Jupiter may be a bit east of Saturn, where right now it's a bit west of Saturn, because Jupiter moves through the sky much quickly, or much more quickly than Saturn. Also, both of them, we shifted over a little bit from uh, Sagittarius. They'll probably be in Capricorn or towards Capricorn uh, by next summer. Mm -hmm. And so, and Jupiter's got those those four bright moons that are in a line, which is always real cool to see. And sometimes uh, a moon will cast a shadow onto Jupiter. And that's always really neat to see. It looks like a round black circle. And it's you know black as ink, and uh, it'll move across uh, with the uh, the moon will actually be somewhere uh, maybe to the left something like that, and so actually seeing the shadow on Jupiter is really cool. Yes. And oh, we've got we've wait, got wait, the red wait, spot. Let me, let me interject something real quick. If for those of you who want to know which moon is which. Um, I opened up my sky and telescope, and it has Jupiter's moons. And depending on which day you're, it's at, it'll show you which moon is which on this really cool chart. They used to do Saturn as well, but they don't anymore, and I don't know why. Um, but this is one way to tell which moon is which and who's in front and behind. Okay, go ahead, Kent. Yeah, I, I use that myself. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, it's really useful if you're going out and observe. It's nice to know whether one of the moons will be behind the planet or in front of the planet because if it's in front you may have a chance of seeing a, a uh, you know a eclipse essentially the shadow falling on the planet awesome and so that that's always cool yes yes and oh and these are binocular objects so if you go outside tonight with a pair of seven by fifties and you look at Jupiter you'll see tiny little 
pinpricks and everything's all in a line. Those are the moons of Jupiter. And you'll see Jupiter is will be the slightly brighter dot. And then you'll see teeny, teeny little dots. And those are the moons. So you can see the moons of Jupiter with just a pair of binoculars. Okay, Kent, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. you want to go on? Uh, let's see. We talked, oh, Saturn, you don't won't see its moons in a pair of binoculars. And they're scattered all over the place. <laughs> You know, Except, they're not in a nice straight line because Saturn's tilted with respect to the plane of the solar system. Right. Where Jupiter's pretty well perpendicular to the plane. So uh, you have to have like a six inch to an eight inch. You know, you'll be able to see a few moons around depending now how dark your area is. Yes. And you can see them here. They're kind of all over the place when I've zoomed into Saturn here. So the only time, isn't it the only time they're kind of mostly sort of in a line, the ones we can see that are really bright? Isn't it when the rings are edge on? It has to be edge on. Yeah. And so when the rings make a line, you know, that rare occasion that occurs twice in a in an orbit of Saturn, which I forget how many years, is it 24 years or something like that for it to go around once? Uh, it happens twice where the rings are totally edge on and the moons then line up. Mm -hmm. It only happens at that time. I've seen it maybe once that I can, many years ago, <laughs> I saw <laughs> it where they were all lined up. And it's pretty cool to see them like that also. But that's, you know, you lose out on the rings, but you make it up for with the moons. Awesome. Okay, great. So do you want to talk about that special magic light that you can see now, or should yeah, we go for Yeah, the zodiacal light yeah. on there. It's, it's kind of interesting. I usually see it in the spring, and what you'll see is a cone of, you know, if you're in a dark area, you see a cone of faint light going up, usually towards the Pleiades uh, in the evening in the spring. And what it is, it's the dust uh, in our solar system reflecting sunlight. And it has a different color than the Milky Way. It's actually yellowish in color versus the Milky Way looks more whitish. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really cool. Sometimes Venus will be in it if, you know, if Venus is in the right cycle at the time. But uh, it's easiest to see in like March and then probably in uh, September near the equinox. And... Uh, you know, for the for the fall equinox, uh, zodiacal light, you've got to stay up, you know, or either get up way early or stay up all night. And it'll look nice about 4 o'clock in the morning. I remember a long time ago, uh, we were observing late, 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 and we were wondering why the sun was starting to rise early. And it wasn't. It was a zodiacal light. It was kind of pointing up towards, if I remember, I was pointing up towards uh, Leo. And so if you want to see it this time of the year, you got to either get up early or stay up way late. <laughs> but awesome. it is really a neat thing to see, and it's neat to compare with the Milky Way because of the color difference. Yes, you can definitely tell there's a color difference there. Awesome. Especially kids. Kids have fantastic eyes for this kind of thing. Um, okay. So, Kent, what is an asterism exactly? Okay, an asterism is just a grouping of stars that makes a pattern that people can recognize easily, like the Big Dipper. You know, everyone recognizes the Big Dipper, but that's not the whole constellations. All the stars in the constellation, there's a lot of them, aren't included in the Dipper. So the Big Dipper is called an asterism. And uh, we'll talk about a couple asterisms tonight. They can include more than one constellation, or they can just be a little grouping. And so, you know, you have little ones and you have big ones. Awesome. And we're, we're going to talk about a big one tonight. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. So should we start with uh, Cepheus? Pardon? Do you want to start with Cepheus? Yeah, let's start with the, what they call the Great Square, which is made up of one of the stars is the bright, you know, Alpha Andromeda. The others, the other three are in Pegasus. And it forms a big square in the sky. And so that's why they call it the Great Square. And uh, it's just kind of a cool asterism. And actually, when it rises, 
it looks more like the great diamond rising up. But eventually when it gets up there, things twist as they get up to the sky. It, it looks like a square when it gets up a ways. But initially when it comes up, it looks kind of like a, uh, a diamond. Nice. Okay, let's, um, before you really dive into this, let me show people how to find the Great Square because they can see a square, but honestly, when they go out tonight, this is what it's going to look like. <laughs> so it's going to look like a whole bunch of dots. So how do you find that Great Square? So here, I'll, I'll connect the dots for you now. Okay, so for the Northern Hemisphere, if you look east, and it's not very far above the eastern horizon, if you'll look east and you're going to see four stars that really stand out as being, you know, pretty, it'll look like a diamond, kind of a square on its side at a 45. That's going to be the great square. A lot of people can recognize, oh, we're going to talk about um, that one later. A lot of people can, if you go look to the south, we talked about Sagittarius last time. You can see the Milky Way. Okay. So it's about that high, but now you're looking east and we're going to see the great square here. Okay, Kent, go ahead. Okay, got the great square then. Yep. We'll talk about the constellations that make it up later. Mm -hmm. uh, the next asterism uh, for tonight is the W in Cassiopeia. And that's a really nice constellation with a, a lot of neat objects in it. Yes. And remember how we talked about how you find Cassiopeia or the W? Yes, I do. Let me back up a little bit so we can show people how to find it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Before you say anything, Kent, hang on a second. Okay, so here we go. Let me uh, shake up the night sky. Ready? Shake, shake, shake. Okay. <laughs> so to f most people can find the Big Dipper. And it's for the Northern Hemisphere, it's up most of the time. So here we are. We're going in my backyard. And now you tell me where's the Big Dipper. Do you see it anywhere? Here, if I zoom in a little bit, does that make it easier? I know on a computer screen it can be a little tough. Okay, do you see it? Do you see the bowl? Now do you see the handle? Okay, so there's the Big Dipper. Now, if we're gonna find, we're gonna need the Little Dipper also. So we're going to take the Big Dipper and we're gonna, here, I'll connect the dots here. You see how the Big Dipper is this here? Okay, so we're gonna take these two here and we're gonna connect them and extend. This is Polaris, this is the pole star. This is where the North Pole of the Earth is currently pointed to. This is the handle of the Little Dipper. Do you see that? So if I show the lines now, if we connect the dots, you can see this is part of Ursa Major. This is the Big Dipper. This is a star pattern that we can see. And if we connect these two, this will lead us to Polaris. And this is the handle of the Little Dipper. All right, Kent, go ahead and tell us, how do we find Cassiopeia? Okay, go to the bowl of the Little Dipper, or the Big Dipper, and look at the star where the handle attaches. It's the fainter star that's in the bowl of the uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Big Dipper there. And if you draw a line from that star over to Polaris and continue it on straight, you'll run into the W of Cassiopeia. Right there. So we took the handles of both, made a line between them, and then extended almost that far, and we have Cassiopeia. And if I label it and connect the dots, you can see it's right there. Isn't that cool? So you're just connecting the two handles. Actually, awesome. actually, no. <laughs> no? Oh, no. What, what did I do wrong? No, it, it actually works with the way you're doing it. But in the, in the book, they were talking about, see the faint star in the bowl, the faintest star in the bowl? Yes. Uh, oh. It, where the handle attaches to the bowl. <laughs> They were saying draw a straight line from that star in the bowl to Polaris and then continue it on <laughs> to get to uh, Cassiopeia. Okay, okay, but, well, take but your I pick. Like, I like airways better because people can, can see. Actually, Mizar and Alcor, uh, the middle star in the handle, the Big Dipper, mm -hmm. by the, the graphics you're showing, if you draw a line from that through Polaris, it'll hit right into the W also. Exactly. The, I guess the thing to remember is they're on opposite sides of the sky. Yes. So a lot of the times when the Big Dipper is down, Cassiopeia is up nice and high. Mm -hmm. Or if, if the Big Dipper is, you know, in the west, Cassiopeia will be on, in the east. Right. 
So here's a, what Kent is talking about. As this is, I sped it up so it's rotating, so we're passing time even faster. And you can see how Ursa Major is going to set, and then Cassiopeia is going to be very high in the sky. Okay, go ahead, Kent. Okay, and uh, oh, let's see. We covered the the asterisms. Now I think we should start on the. Uh, let me bring out the mythology. Okay. Yes, please. Because we've we've got a list there, and. Uh, the mythology, all these guys tie together, Cepheus, Cassiopeia, Perseus, Andromeda, and Pegasus, all tie together in the old legends. And there's all sorts of variations, but it goes something roughly like this. Um, Cepheus was the king of Ethiopia. Cassiopeia was the queen of Ethiopia, and Andromeda was their daughter. And unfortunately, Kathy, Cassiopeia bragged about how beautiful her daughter was, and it uh, kind of made the sea nymphs angry. So they went and complained to uh, Triton, the god of the sea. And he sent out a monster, uh, a sea monster, to ravage the coast of Ethiopia. And the, uh, the god said essentially... If you chain your daughter to the rocks as a sacrifice to the sea monster, then they'll leave everyone alone. So that's why Andromeda is called the chained lady, is she's chained to the rocks as a sacrifice to the monster. And then Perseus is the hero. He's the guy that's a son of Zeus, and uh, they often show him holding the head of Medusa, a Medusa was a lady with snakes in her hair. If you looked at her, you turned to stone. And so he killed Medusa and used the head like a weapon. He put a, um, oh, a shroud over it. And uh, he also had Pegasus. That was a winged horse. Is another gift. He got a bunch of gifts from the gods. And so when uh, the monster was attacking Cassiopeia, he flew over and essentially dropped the equivalent of a thermal nuke on the monster. He, you know, pulled the, <laughs> the shroud off of Medusa's head. The monster saw it, turned totally to stone, and died right there. <laughs> and so that's the whole legend, you know, uh, my, my quick and rough cut of the legend. There's all sorts of variations on it. In fact, there was a movie made in the 80s called... Clisha the Titan. Yes, people yeah. are already referencing it in the chat box and saying that you have to go back and watch it now. So they already caught on to our, the our theme this month. <laughs> yeah, one extra thing. The sea monster is also in the constellations, but it's so far south and so far east, it's, it is not something to be seen this month, maybe next month. It's called Cetus. They have it as a whale, but mm -hmm. it's also the monster. And so that's the whole legend behind these guys. Awesome. Okay, well, let's go back to the science side of things, shall we? You want to start with Mew? Yeah, yeah, this is in uh, Cepheus, who's the king. Okay. And unfortunately, he doesn't have a really bright constellation. No. It looks more like a, kind of like a jack-in-the-box. But <laughs> anyhow, yeah, Mew... Uh, Cepheus is called Herschel's Garnet Star. When you look up there, you see there's a, a tint to it. But in reality, it's a monstrous size red supergiant star. It's so large that its surface is beyond the orbit of Jupiter. So this, we're talking about a monster star. It's just humongously large, one of the biggest stars you can see with the naked eye. It's about a hundred thousand times brighter than the sun, and you know, for for looking up there, it's probably the brightest for the uh, for the magnitude range. It kind of varies. It goes uh, between uh, the fifth and the third magnitude, so it gets a little bit brighter, gets a little bit dimmer, but for most of the time, it's around the fourth magnitude. Okay. But it's a really big star. It's about 2,000 light years away in distance. Awesome. Now, let me show oh, folks oh. how to find it before we go too much further. Um, it's going to be almost straight over, well, not quite straight overhead. Um, 
So if we're looking again at the sky, and again, let, um, let me connect the dots real quick and then show you. Remember, we started with the Big Dipper, we found the Little Dipper, and then you're gonna go, you're gonna continue on. So we have the Big Dipper, we're gonna connect the bowl when, the way we did to find Polaris, and then we're just gonna keep extending that line till we find a little triangle. Now, if we've gone over here to Cassiopeia, we've gone too far. So we're looking for this star pattern between the Little Dipper and Cassiopeia. So here, I'm going to turn off the stars. I'm not going to turn off the stars. <laughs> that would be a totally different class. Um, I'm going to turn off the lines. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to move the sky a little bit. Can you find the Big Dipper? Can you find it? Okay, good. Right here. You see it? Big Dipper. Now, where's the Little Dipper? Quick, quick, quick. Point it out with your fingers. Where is it? Where's Polaris? Which one? Is it this one? <laughs> no this one remember we connected these two parts of the Big Dipper's bowl here okay now do you see Cassiopeia if we connect the handle stars together we go to Cassiopeia that's too far so we're gonna connect these two on the bowl go to Polaris and then go a little bit further until we start to see faint stars in a jack-in-the-box pattern do you see it here it's it's hard to see because those are Kind of faint stars. Do you see it now? I'm going to turn it off. Do you see it? I'll turn it back on. I'll turn it off. Now, where's the star we were just talking about? It's going to be a little orange star right here. So I'm going to turn it off again, see if you can do it. Find the Big Dipper. Okay, find Polaris. Okay, and now what are you going to do? Okay, you're going to go a little bit further. Okay, here are the four stars in the box. Here's the triangle. And the garnet star is right there. You did it. Awesome. Okay, Kent, go ahead. There's something else here too, isn't there? Yeah, actually, uh, there's a lot of dust between us and uh, Mu Cephei or Herschel's garnet star. Uh, there's so much dust that it blocks about two and a half magnitudes. So if there wasn't any dust, it'd really be a, you know, really stand out there might be the brightest star in <laughs> in uh, Cepheus <laughs> but there you know the dust and 2,000 light years you can gather up a lot of dust uh, does dim it down a bit it does now there's something closer to the handle of Polaris right or the, the little dipper I mean oh the the next object yes okay next object is a really really old open cluster which is called NGC, which stands for New General Catalog, number 188. Mm -hmm. And it was discovered by John Herschel on November 3rd, 1831. It's just a little faint cluster. The significance of it is how old it is. It's on the order of 5 billion years old, and it's still holding together. You know, the, the cluster R sun was formed and broke apart a long long time ago mm -hmm. but for some reason this little cluster of stars has hung together for five billion years so that's for an open cluster that's ancient that's yeah. really a long long time uh for that cluster so that's why you know why i thought it was an object worth discussing yeah. just because it was so ancient right and just so you see it here on the, whoops, I unclicked it, sorry. Um, okay, so do you see the little dipper here? If I turn on the, the lines, do you see it? How close it is to the handle? So with your binoculars, when you're looking at Polaris, you just want to start your journey towards Cepheus, and then it'll be right by the handle. Okay, good. It's only about four degrees from Polaris. Yeah, it's really close by. Okay, great. Do you want to continue on to Cassiopeia? Yeah, let's go on to Cassiopeia and discuss one of my favorite clusters, or open clusters, and that's the Owl Cluster, or NGC 457. All right. That's one of my favorites, actually. It really does look like an owl. Yeah, in, in my 20-inch, in the, my big 2-inch uh, eyepiece, it looks like a stick figure. You got the two bright eyes, you got little body, you got the feet, and the wings are going up on either side. Mm -hmm. So for kids, it's really easy when you tell them it's a stick figure. They <laughs> usually catch it. 
Adults it is. take a little bit longer, you know. It totally is. Now, this owl is actually kind of upside down. So the two eyeballs here and here are the wings and here are the little feet. So, um, yeah. yeah. Since my telescope reverses everything, he flies upright in my scope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you know how to find Cassiopeia. We already talked about that. So make yourself a little note. There are two triangles in Cassiopeia. This is by the shallower triangle here. And you can kind of see it right there. And this is this a binocular object, Kent? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's not very bright, but it's a binocular object. If you have big binoculars like yours, it should show up fairly well. Mm hmm what I usually do is use those last two stars in the W there, the lower two stars, mm -hmm. draw a straight line out from them, and it kind of comes close awesome. to uh, the owl cluster. Nice. And you can find the little owl, which is very good because it's close to Halloween, so people can look at the owl up in the sky. See? Doesn't he look like an owl? Okay, great. Um, do you want to talk about Ada? Yeah, let's talk about Ada. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, a naked eye star. It's, uh, you know, between two of the brighter stars in the W, and uh, it's a visual binary, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you can't really see it as a binary, but when you look at it, you can see the star that makes up the binary. And it's, it's built out of two stars. Uh, one is yellow, the other one's kind of orangish. They're about 13 arc seconds apart. So. They're, they've got a nice separation to them. Uh, the other thing is the, the brighter yellow one's about three and a half uh, for magnitude, three and a half uh, uh, for brightness. And then the fainter reddish one is a 7.4 magnitude star. And the interesting thing is the yellow one is very close to our sun's brightness. So... The pair of them is about 19 light years away. So if you wanted to see what our sun looks like at 19 light years, you just look up there at Eta Cassiopeia, and you'll see that's how dim our sun would be if it was 19 light years away. Mm -hmm. Nice. Also, it takes about, I think, about 480 years for them to go through a, a cycle for one to orbit the other. Yes. Yeah, that's and just it amazing. Was found by William Herschel in uh, 1799. Perfect. And I was thinking the. Was there any more in. Oh, yes, well, yes. There's, there's NGC. Another, yeah, there's go ahead. There's actually a couple neat ones, but there's a. Yes. A, the next in line is a really beautiful open cluster. It was discovered by Carolyn Herschel using a little sweeper telescope. Uh, she found it on October 30th, 1783. It's uh, magnitude 6.6, .6, so some sharp-eyed people could probably see it naked eye if you had good conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a rich open cluster. They also call it uh, um, Carolyn's rows because there's loops and there's a lot of detail mm -hmm. to that uh, that star cluster and it's actually between Sigma and Rho uh, Cassiopeia so those two stars bracket it and makes it easy to find in binoculars definitely you know binocular object it's really pretty in a telescope yeah. you know no matter what size you use mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah, NGC 7789, it's kind of a hard number to remember. There's so many NGC numbers, <laughs> but also it's called Carolyn's Rose. Nice. So that may be easier to remember it by, but it is, it is a beautiful object there in Cassiopeia. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And how about M52? And then you can tell us what the M is for in a yeah, minute. Yeah, that's a Messier. M, M stands for Messier. Mm -hmm. Charles Mezier was a French comet hunter, and he made up this nuisance list of fuzzy objects. And he he was dealing with really, really bad telescopes, <laughs> really small telescopes, so everything looked like a blob. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was looking for blobs that moved, which ended up being comets. He didn't really care anything for the blobs that didn't move. So he made up a nuisance list of the, the blobs that looked like comets but weren't. And that turns out to be the 
the list that all the amateurs start with that has all <laughs> the really neat objects. You know, it's yes. really a, a nice beginning list. It was the list of things not to look at because <laughs> he wanted to be known for comets. And now it's what yeah, astronomers yeah, it, look at first. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, the thing people don't remember is comets. Mm -mm. They remember his nuisance list. <laughs> yes. And this, you know, this was number 52 on his nuisance list. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, nice little cluster, uh, fairly bright. Let's see if I've got, do I have a magnitude there? Yeah, I have magnitude 6.9. It's about 4,600 light years away. Uh, it's, it's just a nice little cluster. You can see in binoculars. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the previous cluster, uh, uh, Carolyn's Rose, it's 7,600 light years away. So it's getting out there. Mm -hmm. But M52 is in a little bit closer at 4,600 light years away. Yeah. And the really kind of interesting thing is you've got this open cluster, and then about 35 minutes, I think it's off to the east, um, or it may be the west. I, I can't remember for sure. <laughs> but there's a, uh, a nebula called the Bubble Nebula, and it's a super hot star in a nebula is blowing a actual bubble. And uh, it's... It's not centered in the bubble. It's actually off to one side. And in my 8-inch, I've actually seen some of the curvature of the bubble. You can't see the thing all the way around, but you can follow it a little ways. So the, the bubble's kind of like an extra that M52 is usually uh, associated with in photographs and things like that. Mm -hmm. There, you've got it. Uh, yeah, so you can look at both of these, and they're really just between the uh, Cepheus and Cassiopeia. So they're really easy to find. So just kind of let your eyes wander through the, tel the uh, binoculars that you have, or just look up, and you'll be able to see those, those objects are pretty much in between both of the constellations. Yeah, M M52 will be the easiest. Trying to see anything of the bubble would be kind of rough with just binoculars. But because it's nearby, I figured I'd bring it up. Awesome. Okay, should we move on to Perseus? Yeah, let's move on to Perseus. And Perseus is usually shown as, you know, a, a hero with his sword in one hand, and he has the head of Medusa in the other. And uh, our first star is called the demon star, Al Ghul or the Eye of Medusa. And uh, there's some debate about whether the ancients knew that it got brighter and dimmer or not. There's no record, written records, but they really uh, put the uh, evilness onto that star. And so there was something they didn't like about it. But they, they made it the, uh, the evil Eye of Medusa. And that's shown in like the... Uh, Oh, you know, the decorative type pictures of constellations where they would overlay a, uh, a neat picture. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always shown as the head of Medusa there. And it's kind of interesting because it does get brighter and dimmer. And what it turned out to be is what they call an eclipsing binary star. The two stars are so close that you can't separate them with even big telescopes. You actually you have to use spectral analysis to separate them. But what happens is the brighter star, which is kind of bluish, is three times the diameter of our sun and about 100 times brighter than our sun. Uh, they're located like 93 light years away. And then its companion, which is really close in, is just about the same size, about three times the diameter, maybe a little bit larger, but it's only four times brighter than our sun. So you've got one star that's 100 times brighter than our sun and one star that's four times brighter than our sun, and they're separated by about the 20% the distance from Mercury to the sun. So they're really close together. And what happens is when the fainter star passes in front of the bright star, it really dims it down. And so about every 59 hours, the, uh, the uh, Agol star, Algol, 
-hmm. it drops from 2.1 magnitude down to 3.4 over that five-hour period. And then once it gets down to 3.4, then it starts getting brighter again. It takes another five hours for it to get up to three or up to 2.1. So it has a noticeable difference. People can track it with their naked eye if they're patient, and they use the surrounding stars as guideposts for how bright it is. But uh, it goes way back for uh, a variable star. It's the second known variable star. I think it was found in like 16, let's see, 1667. So that's going back before... You know, that's, that's way back. That's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, before Mezier, before Herschel. Mm-hmm. Uh, it goes way back uh, on that. But, yeah, it's the second known variable star. The first known variable star is one they call Mira, and it's in Cetus, the, uh, the monster or the whale. And uh, it, it is one that just the physics of it, it gets brighter and dimmer due to pressure. Uh, variances on the inside mm-hmm. and so maybe we'll talk about that one another time yeah maybe in another one um yes definitely and uh for those of you who are just popping on i know people pop on and off this is aurora and kent and brian with the central coast astronomical society we are doing stargazing for the month and we're walking you through some of the constellations so tonight when you go outside you look up you know exactly what you're looking at in this part of the sky So Kent is sharing his knowledge with you. He is not sitting in front of star charts. He's simply on the phone having a conversation and I am providing the Planetarium Star Show visuals to go with it. And again, if you do have questions, you're welcome to uh, send us an email of questions at centralcoastastronomy.org or you can put it in the chat box. Brian is doing his very best to answer as many of those as possible. Okay, so Kent, um, let's see, we talked about Algol. Do you want to talk about the double cluster? Yeah, let's talk about the double cluster okay. because it's a, it's a naked eye object. It is a naked eye object. That's if awesome. It, if it's dark and you can go out, you can see this little fuzzy patch kind of between, it looks like it's between Perseus and Cassiopeia. Mm-hmm. And it's been known, you know, way back. It's one of the ones that they could see and go, well, we don't know what it is, but it's a fuzzy patch. <laughs> and uh, they think it goes as far back as the 2nd century B.C. Uh, to Hipparchus's star catalog. Wow. But there's no existing copies. Uh, the next star catalog that kind of referenced it was Ptolemy's in the 2nd century A.D., where he talks about these fuzzy uh, patches in the sky or little clouds in the sky. And I think he gave Tol- or, uh, Hipparchus credit for that but it's it's way old you know it's it's one of those that's listed there isn't really a discover because it's always been visible up there mm-hmm. and so the big question is why didn't it have a messier number it does not have messier numbers <laughs> and it, in fact the double cluster it's got ngc numbers there's uh one is called ngc 869 the other mm-hmm. one is ngc 884 yes and they're two beautiful open clusters you can see it in binoculars but in a telescope it just really blows you away yes it's really a you know especially you want to use low power so you have a wide field mm-hmm. and the neat thing is there's some little orange stars in between i think there's like five stars that you can actually see the yeah. orange tint that are around these guys so that's always really cool. Now, They're Kent, about... let, me, let me ask you a question that's been coming in a number of times here. People are wondering, can you really see the different colors in the stars? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're talking tints for the most part. You know, mm-hmm. it isn't like a knockout red. It'll be reddish tint. It's kind of like, um, oh, pale colors like watercolors or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's mainly tints. You don't see a bright blue you don't see bright, you know, yellows. You usually see tints, but it's it's definitely recognizable. And, you know, planetary nebulas, you can actually see green or blue. Uh, shows up quite well, uh, depending on whether you're, you know, not colorblind for low light conditions. And so you can definitely see colors. In fact, when I got my 20-inch scope, the first thing when I hauled it out and 
wanted to see how it was working. I put it on the Orion Nebula, and I could see green around the trapezium with my 20-inch. And I was going like, whoa, this is good. <laughs> I <laughs> knew I, I got a good scope. I'd purchased a, a really decent scope at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of colors. There's some variable stars. There's one called Arloporus mm -hmm. that if you catch it at a minimum, it does look like a drop of blood on the sky. It is red, red. But you got to catch it at the minimum. Yeah. So you have to do some research on Arloporus. But it's yes. very red. You know, and, uh, at this, I was going to say, we should probably make the distinction that you'll see the tints, but you, the nebula will not appear in color. Like, I've got a picture right now up on Stellarium. It, it's rare to see any color in the nebula for the yes. most part. The brighter planetary nebula are an exception. And there's one other exception, which is the trifid. For some reason, I see a light pink on the trifid with my 8-inch. That just may be me, but I think other people have mentioned it also. And so, yeah, most nebulas, they look white. Yeah. And that's about it, you right. know. Right. And the, the, it, um, just, your eyes are not as able to detect all of those frequencies the way a camera can, the way way back in the day the film could, <laughs> the way the CCD cameras can, even in like your cell phone. Um, so your camera has a greater ability to see many more wavelengths than your eye can process in that moment. So, the other and, thing um, is uh, the I younger... I know the chat is exploding right now asking for equipment recommendations. Um, we'll, we'll answer those at the end. And, yes, I will tell everybody about the giant binoculars behind me as well as the telescope. So I will answer all the equipment questions at the end. You're welcome to put your recommendations in, of course. But um, I, I do um, I want to save that for the end of the show. Okay. So, Kent, where, where were we? We were doing... We were doing the double cluster. The double cluster. Okay, we did that. Do, uh, do we finish with that one? Are we ready for M34? Yeah, let's let's finish with it. Uh, we're we're okay. starting to get low on time, so yeah. let's go for let's M34, another Messier object, an open cluster. Okay. It's mag 5.2, so that's fairly bright. Yes. And uh, uh, it's in Perseus there. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know... I guess if you've got really good eyes, yeah, 5.2, you should be able to see it naked eye. I usually don't even try because my eyes aren't that good, but <laughs> I maybe should, especially when it gets up nice and high. Yes. Then you've got a real good chance. Uh, it was discovered by Hordernia before 1650, but the identification is uncertain. They're not quite sure whether or not it really is uh, M34. So the next person in line is Messier. Uh, he has uh, sighting on the 25th of August, uh, 1764. And this cluster is about uh, 1,630 light years away. Um, got about 400 stars in it. And, <laughs> you know, it's just a nice, uh, nice open cluster to go after. And it's not a real dim object, so that's always nice. Yes. Now, let me show folks where to find Perseus. Um, okay, it's quiz time, everyone. You ready? Here we go. I'm going to make the sky look different. Oh, wait. how about we put the, the horizon in? <laughs> make it a little easier. Okay, here we go. Quiz, quiz time. Where is the Big Dipper? Anybody? Can you guys find it? Where's the Big Dipper? Good. Where's the Little Dipper? Okay, we're going to connect these two scars. There's Polaris. There's the Little Dipper. Good. Where's the Jack in the Box? <laughs> Where's Cepheus? We're going to continue that line until we see a box and we see stars. Good. Where's Cassiopeia? Okay, so we have the handle star of the Big Dipper or Mizar and Elcor, um, either one. And then we're going to connect that with the handle uh, star Polaris of the Little Dipper. And we're going to connect that until we get to this W over here. We have Cassiopeia. Good. Here, let me connect the dots real quick. How'd you do? Did you guys get those? Okay, good. Now, Perseus is going to be real low northeast, almost dead northeast. So if we're looking north and then we're working east is over here, northeast, Perseus is going to be this guy in here. And he's really just right below Cassiopeia. So once you find Cassiopeia, go straight down to the horizon. And you will see Perseus in there, and you'll be able to see the things that we were just talking about. And, okay, you know, Ken, you can... did we finish M34? Well, one thing, Aurora, I noticed on your graphics. Yes. Because I've, I've got you. Not, I, I found, found out how not to have such a big time lag. Uh, 
you can actually see the double cluster there on your graphics. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a little fuzzy patch between uh, uh, Cassiopeia and Perseus, and I can see this little fuzzy patch, and that's the double cluster. Look so at that. It, do you see it there? Yes. Let me see if I can show people. I, I believe it shows up. Uh, it, you know, it's it's quite easy to see with uh, using inverted vision. It really pops out. It does. It does. But okay. I didn't realize it, it showed up on your graphics there when you have the, <laughs> the wide field view. That's kind of a bonus, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's always nice uh, uh, when you get something like that. Nice. Okay, um, how about Andromeda? I know people are wondering what this is over here. <laughs> so once yeah, you find Andromeda. Cassiopeia, scoot yourself over to Andromeda. And Kent talked about this in the beginning. There was a great square of Pegasus. You see that Right, there? we got the great square, and one corner star is Alpha Andromeda. That one right there. And the really nice thing about Andromeda is... It's got three bright stars, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. And they're all stretched out uh, going from right to left. Mm -hmm. uh, you start with Alpha, then you go Beta, and then you go Gamma. And they're all like second magnitude stars. But you go the middle one, Beta, which is actually the brightest of the three, and you go up one, two stars, and there's a fuzzy thing uh, up there. Now, is that and a that naked fuzzy eye fuzzy thing? That's a naked eye fuzzy thing, believe it or not. Uh, you got to use averted vision, but that is the farthest object most people can see with the naked eye. It's another galaxy. It's two and a half million light years away, which is a long, long way. And you can see a couple little satellite galaxies. Uh, Messier called it M31. A lot of people know it's a great Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that people may not realize is when you look at your graphics, you see all these stars around there. Well, all those stars are in our galaxy. If you went in a spaceship between Andromeda and the Milky Way and got out with, a, you know, wearing a, a, a space suit, it'd be totally black. There wouldn't be any stars anywhere. It'd just be total blackness in all directions. And then you'd look down, there'd be a little fuzzy patch in one area. And you'd look the opposite, and there'd be another little fuzzy patch. <laughs> one fuzzy patch is the Milky Way. One fuzzy patch is Andromeda. And there's zip in between. There may be a few odd stars that got thrown out, but for the most, it would look nothing like what we see because we're inside of a galaxy. We have a sky full of stars. Yeah. And you wouldn't see that if you were between Andromeda and the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a weird thing to think about. It is. Most people don't realize that. So, yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned a satellite galaxy. Tell me about that. There's two of them I think we were going to highlight. Yeah. Messier called, you know, the great Andromeda galaxy M31. Mm -hmm. And then we've got two little satellite galaxies. One's very close. That's M32. And then kind of on the opposite side... That one year, let's say there's M110, which looks more elliptical rather than round. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two satellite galaxies. Um, oh, also, I should get on a little bit on the history of the discovery of Andromeda Galaxy. It's probably been known forever, but in the first, let's see, when was it? It was uh, 964 AD, a Persian scholar by the name of Al Sufi. Uh, made the first written records about Andromeda as being a fuzzy patch. The, the next guy to actually write down something was uh, Simon Marius in 1612. He saw it used in a very early telescope because 1608 was when the first telescope was made. So this is like four years later, and he's looking at the Andromeda galaxy. So that's some of the history behind it. Nice. Um, now, did and we talk about 404 yet? Oh, pardon? Did we talk about M, um, uh, NGC 404? Uh, no, we haven't. Okay. And uh, let's see, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the satellite galaxy oh, real yes, quick. Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. 
Yeah, M31 uh, can be seen in binoculars under good conditions. Uh, it was discovered uh, by a French astronomer, Le Gentel, on October 29, 1749. Mm-hmm. Uh, M110 was actually discovered by Messier, but it wasn't put into his list. His list, I think, went to like 104 and stopped. Mm-hmm. But in 1801, he mentioned this this object up there. And so they decided to add it to his list. And at the time, they were at 109. This became 110. Mm-hmm. But also, Carolyn Herschel found it independently uh, a little bit later. So uh, Mezier gets the uh, discovery credit, but Herschel, uh, you know, Carolyn Herschel gets the, uh, uh, you know, independent discovery credit. Yeah. Anyhow, that's all I wanted to say about that's those perfect. guys. Thank you so much. And yes, people are just amazed that you are not reading a script right now. Um, <laughs> that you're actually just answering questions as they come in. Um, okay, great. So uh, we want to go to 404. Let's do the 404. Is, go ahead. You know, we, we talked about beta using the beta star. You got alpha, beta, and gamma. They're kind of strung out there yes. roughly in a line. And beta has a galaxy really near to it. It's called Mirach's Ghost. Excuse me, Mirach's Ghost. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, it's given an NGC number, 404, but beta Andromeda is also called Mirach. And it can be easily seen in an 8-inch scope. It's just like a little fuzzy patch there. It's magnitude 11.7. And let's see if I have any. It's 6.4 arc seconds northwest of beta. So it's got some separation. It's not too uh, too close. Beta itself is magnitude 2.03. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's just, you know, kind of like a freebie galaxy. Put your telescope on. <laughs> beta and then wander around yes. you'll find it and yes. so that's why i threw in uh 404 on there uh-huh uh, now just to recap real quick so for andromeda so when you're at cassiopeia and you've done perseus you're going to come over to andromeda here here we'll take off the labels and everything okay and so we did cassiopeia you guys now know how to find that right below it is going to be perseus and we looked at this before Andromeda, we have these three stars, one, two, three. And then this is the star that has that ghost he was just talking about, Merrick's ghost, NGC 404. And then if we go up here, we are going to see the Andromeda galaxy, which is naked eye. So you'll just see kind of a fuzzy patch. So right in this section is where we're talking about. Okay, go ahead, Kent. Okay, the next one is Gamma Andromeda. Yes. It's magnitude 2.12. It's a beautiful double star. It's uh, got a golden yellow for the brighter star, mm-hmm. and uh, the the fainter one is. Let's see if I actually said what it looked like. Mm-hmm. I may have lost. Let's see. Uh, you got a golden yellow, brighter one, and then the other one is. They've got it blue. Okay, yeah, blue. <laughs> it's a blue component. Uh, so you got a golden yellow and a fainter blue one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's one of the finest double stars for a small telescope. Yes. And so it's easy to find. It's nice and bright with the the main component being a 2.12. Then you got the the fainter component at 5.08, and they've got a separation about 10 arc seconds. So, you know that should be easily pulled up at low power mm-hmm. on a you know, smaller, medium-sized telescope. But it is it is a nice color difference one. Yes. You know, having the yellow and the blue kind of reminds me of uh, Alberio when we were talking about Cygnus, the swan, and Alberio being one of the better double stars in the sky. Perfect. Yes. And we'll, um, well, I've gotten a number of questions about magnitude and uh, how far down we can see. Let me l- let us finish the constellations. We have one more to do, Pegasus, and then I'll answer the magnitude questions, the binocular questions. What spacing can I expect to see? What magnitude can I expect to see? So I'll answer those questions as soon as we're done. So Kent, let's go ahead and are you ready for Pegasus? Yeah, let's go for Pegasus. Okay. 
the the real showcase item, as far as I'm concerned, is Mezier 15, okay. which is a really nice and rich globular cluster in Pegasus. And it's got a, a magnitude 6 star nearby to it, uh, which you, when you look up in the uh, with binoculars, you'll see this magnitude 6 star. And then just east of it, there's this little fuzzy guy. <laughs> and or let's see, no, it's west just west of it but uh the uh you know the, the globular is magnitude 6.2 so if you had really sharp eyes you might be able to differentiate it because uh, the star will more more look like a pinpoint mm -hmm. where the globular will look like a a fatter fuzzier star and uh so that's you know uh one way of telling the difference and there's there's a few occasions like Messier uh, 5 in Serpents that has a bright star near to it, where basically I find the bright star and then there's a fuzzy thing. I know that's Messier 5. Mm -hmm. This M15 is 39,000 light years away, and it was discovered in 1746 by a French astronomer, uh, Jean Dominique Miraldi. So that's about all the information I have. One interesting thing about this globular cluster is it has a planetary nebula inside of it. And there's been some good Hubble photos of that planetary nebula. Under good conditions, with filters, with my 20-inch, I can just pull that one in. So it's not easy, but you can get it in a big scope. And I yeah, think that's about that's, all I have to say about that that's one. That's <laughs> really rare, too, to have a planetary nebula inside of a... It, it's really unusual. What may have happened is two stars, since the stars are so close, they may have mashed into each other. And so you end up with a single star, what they call blue straggler, that has a lot of fuel. And it can actually evolve to the point it can make a planetary nebula. And so it may, may have been derived off a... Of you know, two fairly large stars that ran into each other made a blue straggler, and the thing was able to have enough mass to make a planetary nebula, you mm -hmm. know, down the line. That thing's billions of years old, probably uh, 10 to 12 billion years old. Uh, most globulars are really, really, really ancient and old, mm -hmm. so it's had enough time. In fact, the miracle thing about it is that we happen to see it now because a uh, planetary nebula will only last I don't know I've heard numbers from 10,000 to 50,000 years yeah. and this thing's been out there for billions of years so we're just lucky enough it's not gone it just happened to form at the right time where we're around to see it uh, you know right now yeah yeah that is really lucky all right, Kent, we have uh, probably about 10 million questions that have come in. Um, so <laughs> hang on just for a second. Brian has been selecting out some that we'll answer. Um, just really quick to review what we've done tonight. This will take 60 seconds, and you're going to tell me. So if I show you the screen, where's Mars? Ready? Go. Where is it? We're looking east. This is an E. This is an S for south. Here's the Milky Way. Okay, I'm really kind of zoomed out so much that it's starting to fish eye, so, but that's just my screen. Okay, so do you see Mars? It's low, it's rising about 10 o'clock tonight on the northern hemisphere. We have a bright orange star on the ecliptic, which means there's two other planets on the ecliptic. Where are they? That's right, they're right by the Milky Way. So if you go south, you're going to see this Milky Way band if you're lucky enough to have dark skies. And you look straight up, and you're going to see Saturn, and you're going to see Jupiter. Very good. Good, good, good. Okay, what else did we talk about? Oh, we talked about Mercury just a little bit, but it's probably already set by the time I've seen this. Okay, so let's see if we can find the Big Dipper. Does anybody see it? Point it out. Okay, good. Can you find Polaris? Really quick, last time. Okay, Polaris is right here. We're going to connect these two stars. Here's the Big Dipper, the bowl. Here's the handle. We're going to find Polaris, which is right there. Okay, can you find the Little Dipper? That's right, right in here. Okay, now we're going to connect the handle stars of the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. And where does that take us? Do you remember? Say it out loud. Even if I can't hear you, say it out loud. Cassiopeia is the W or the M or the 3, depending on how it's oriented in the sky around Polaris. 
Okay, so here's Cassiopeia. Okay, and what did we say was right below Cassiopeia? Do you remember? We had the hero. We had Perseus is down in here. Good. And we talked about a number of things. The owl cluster in Cassiopeia is er, <laughs> is in here. And we talked about other um, uh, Ada. Uh, Ada Cassiopeia was in here as well. Okay, good. And then here's Perseus. There was a number of really cool things in there that we mentioned. Now look over here. Do you see one, two, three bright stars? You see um, this is Cassiopeia. Here's Perseus. And then what, what were these? Do you remember this? Andromeda, that's right. And so we had alpha, beta, and gamma. Beta, this is where you're gonna find the ghost. Go straight up, and here's the Andromeda galaxy with its satellite galaxies as well. Now, where is that great square? Where would you find that? Do you see anything that looks kind of square-ish? Oh, I forgot Cepheus. <laughs> we'll go back and pick him up. Okay, where is the great, great square of Pegasus? Okay, there's Mars again. We're gonna look east. We're gonna go straight up. We're going to see a square that's kind of on a corner. You see that there? Okay, and one of those corners was Andromeda, the one, two, three bright stars that we saw. Okay, on Pegasus is right off of his nose was the last object that we were just talking about with M15. And if I highlight Pegasus, you can see where his nose is, and that object was right in there. So how'd you do? Uh, Cepheus, yes, I, I completely forgot, sorry. <laughs> so he was right above Cassiopeia. But we had talked about a number of times how to find him. Okay. All right. Phew. Nice job, Kent. Yay. <laughs> okay. Let me answer the binocular questions first, equipment questions. And Kent, while I'm fiddling with binoculars, do you want to talk about magnitude? Just give us like a 40 second. Blurb I can give you a quick thing about magnitude. Yeah, because you said magnitude uh, two, you said magnitude seven. What is that? Yeah, it turns out it goes all the way back to the old Greeks. Uh, I think it was Hipparchus, or it could have been Ptolemy, but I think it was Hipparchus. Uh, when he made his star catalog, he assigned brightest, the brightest stars as magnitude 1, and the faintest stars as magnitude 6. Magnitude 6 is what you can barely see, and then he kind of graded it up, and it turns out that it's pretty close to what we use today for the magnitude scale. It turns out when you go from a one to a six, that's about a hundred times brightness increase. So each step of the way gives you roughly about two and a half times brighter. So, so as I, as I go through a, the scale though, which way am I getting brighter? Oh yeah, that's the other weird thing. As the number gets smaller, <laughs> the star gets brighter. So if you end up with extremely bright objects, they have to use negative numbers. You know, this is a modern invention. The, the Greeks did not know, you know, didn't use negative numbers. Right. But, uh, yeah, our sun, I think, is minus 26. So it's, it's way up there. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. But that's, yeah. you know, the way they set it up. And, you know, we're big on tradition in astronomy. So... We're keeping the ancient Greek tradition alive for magnitudes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Perfect. Does, it, Thank does you. that make sense? Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Um, okay, so magnitude, what can I expect to see? Um, depending on your eyes, of course, it's going to be a little bit different for everyone. So that's why I put magnitude information with all these objects. So you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, I can see a magnitude four, I can see a magnitude six. So whatever that is for you, so you can kind of get, gauge what that is. With binoculars, typically, um, this is uh, a pair of seven, uh, it'll say 7x50, so seven by 50s is typically how people say it. Um, and so with a pair of binoculars like this, you'll be able to see probably down to magnitude seven or eight. Again, depending on your eyes, some people are better, some people have eyes that, you know, they've lived a good life so far. <laughs> so um, the, the 7x50 uh, refers to the power and also how much light collecting ability we have. So the 7x uh, will tell us, I'm looking through here and I'm going to see objects seven times their regular size. And then the 50 is going to be the millimeter size here. So I've got 7x50s. Notice how they look real similar to my 10x. 50s, right? My 10 by 50s, my 7 by 50s. These are $35. These are $150. <laughs> Honestly, any binoculars you have in the house are probably going to be just fine as long as nobody's dropped them, right, Kent? 
Yeah, you drop them. If if you look through them and the images don't coincide, they've been dropped. Do not buy them if they look that way. Yes. Okay, people are asking about these. My new favorite astronomy gadget. The whole reason to get into astronomy is you can have gadgets. You get green lasers, you get optics, you get binoculars. These are 25 by 100. So this has um, 25 times the magnifying power. And then this is 100 millimeters here. So basically um, what this is, it's like a 10 or 12 pound small telescope. So I can see things in here that I can see with a four or five inch telescope. It's smaller, it's lighter for me, it's more portable. So I'm really enjoying this. And I have double vision, which is great. I can look through both eyes. And this is great, especially if you have kids. Before you buy a telescope, before you even buy binoculars like this, the thing you should be buying is a 20 to 30 to $40 pair of binoculars. This is the best way to start astronomy. Don't buy a telescope because they are useless if you don't know where to point them, right? So before you go buying something like this, this is an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain. This is an LX200, it's made by Mead. Um, typically, I think they used to sell for maybe $2,000-ish plus bells and whistles. Um, this one has a motor drive, it can track, it can do GPS, it gets the information and you punch in what you want, it goes It's a go-to scope. Um, they're expensive and you need to know how to use them, maintain them, and it's a lot of work. So honestly, what we're doing tonight, just go outside, print out the little star charts that we mentioned um, in here. Just grab a pair of inexpensive binoculars and just go learn the night sky, learn the star patterns. That is the best way to do it. If you're ready to move up, then you're going to go to the last page of the handout and here are our telescope recommendations. So it's not enough just to say, I want a telescope. We have to know what it is you want to look at. And so knowing that, and also kind of where you are, are you, um, are you, are you a teacher? Do you, are, is this for a kid? Is this for a grown up? Like what, is your, what are your goals and what do you want to look at? So our telescope recommendations are here and there's a number of them. So please do refer to this so you can take a look. Um, the Schmidt Cassegrain is great, but it's heavy. So I find myself not using it as much as my Newtonian, which doesn't have a go-to, but I learned the night sky so much better on that thing. And it's, it's the same, it's a eight inch in diameter. Um, and so it's really a personal preference. And that's why I like this one because it's so light and easy and I just leave it set up and then I walk outside. So for me, it's, it's worked with the lifestyle and the type of style I, I have for, um, for observing. Other people, they mount a pier and they have a roll off roof and that's fantastic. So. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead. I hope that answers a lot of the equipment questions. Again, if you're looking for this, this is called the Skygazer's Almanac. Obviously, this is the wrong year, but you'll want 2020 and you'll order the right latitude. And this is again from Sky and Telescope. Just look in their online store and you'll find it. Um, the other book recommendation, people are asking what was the book before, Touring the Universe Through Binoculars. This is a great way to get to know the sky. Kent also mentioned H.A. Ray, this book on the stars. And it was printed, what, Kent, back in the 50s or 60s? Uh, 52, I think, or something 52. like that. Yes, so that's also an excellent reference. The planetarium software I was using is called Stellarium, like Stellar, S-T-E-L-L-A-R, I-U-M, stellarium.org. You can download it for free. And the CCAS website, which is um, centralcoastastronomy.org website, has videos on how to actually use it and so you can get started. So in it, it's not hard. It's really easy. And you can see how powerful it is. We just went through a, a good section of the sky and talked about a lot of neat things you can see naked eye and also with binoculars. I think there's only one or two um, telescope, uh, telescope objects in there. Okay, other questions. Um, can we explain? Okay, so we did those questions. Um, we talked about colors. Okay. Binoculars. We got those questions. Wow, we knocked out a lot of these questions. This is fantastic. Brian, let me have your beautiful face on here so it's not just me the whole time. <laughs> Do you have a couple of questions, Brian, that you would like to, um, uh, voice out to Kent to kind of bring you into this conversation. Brian has been working nonstop. I'm sure there's sweat coming off of him because he's just, that wasn't polite. Sorry, because <laughs> he's been working so hard, frantically answering everybody's question. And also thank you to all the CCAS members and that I've seen on there just answering uh, others' questions. Tom, hi. <laughs> and um, Dave, if you're on there, if I missed you, hi. And Glenn. So thank you for helping out as well. We really, really appreciate it. Couldn't do this without you. Um, okay, so let me see if I can magically make you come up. 
and apparently I can't make you come up. Where did you go? Okay, hang on a second. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I have lots of layers on my computer screen right now, so let me find him. He's underneath a lot of layers. Okay, there you are. All right. Hi, Brian. If you're Hello, wondering who is the man behind the furious typing, here he is. Yes, there's me, the furious typing. <laughs> so first of all, thank you, Brian. Yay! Oh, you're welcome. Sure thing. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so many amazing questions. Awesome. Yeah, so um, I think that you've actually addressed most of the questions. I did find one that was interesting equipment-wise. Uh, did you have a chance to bring up image stabilization? Um, I did actually. Okay. I did bring up image. Um, let me get the picture on it. Or you, if you have one, you can share it. Uh, no, I don't have a picture. I was just going to bring up a concept that I okay. think that there's some advertisement we have to watch out where people are trying to market image stabilization, stabilization as if it's some kind of active optics to clean up poor viewing. And we would say that that is not the case. It's mostly for helping from handshake or however you're holding the, the binoculars, right? Yeah. This is my image stabilization right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Excellent. it happens to everyone. As soon as you breathe on the binoculars, you, so these binoculars are heavy, and so they need their own tripod. Oh, I don't even know if people can see me. They're, they're looking at you. Um, yes, you are. You're at the top of the thumbnail. Yeah, I'm at the top. I'm, I'm at the top. Let me make myself huge. Okay, here we go. So um, so these binoculars are heavy, so they, they have to have a tripod. You don't need to buy the fancy tripod that they've matched. You can use an old one from like a like video cameras. For those heavy video cameras, you can use that as well. It has to have a pan head and so forth. Um, but it takes a good 5-10 seconds after you move it into position for everything to even out. And like Kent was saying in the beginning, when you're viewing Mars, you have to wait and be patient for the air to steady down, and that's using a telescope. So astronomy isn't a, ooh, wow, whiz, bang, look at that, look at that. It's a much more subtle art to viewing and learning how to look. There are some things that you can only see when you look straight on, and some things you can only see when you look off to the side, and then it'll pop into view. So, so there's a lot of fine details that need to happen, and it, it's an art form that you start to develop. It's a skill. Yes, hey, definitely, Aurora? but... Yes, Ken. Uh, I've got. Uh, have Have you ever tried vibration suppression pads on a tripod? Have I tried your? I missed half of what you said. Say it one more time. Oh, have we, they have oh. these orange hockey pucks called vibration suppression pads, and you put one under each leg of a tripod, and they actually work. They actually suppress vibration. Uh, they came out with them oh years and years ago. But uh, I was just curious if you had them or not. I'm muted. Sorry. Um, no, I you haven't know, to tried To me, those. they look like they look like a hockey puck. Yeah. And they have like an orange, uh, the I've got orange a plastic of it. on the outside, and then a, a really kind of gooey plastic on the inside, and then a hard little plastic piece. And there they are, vibration suppression pads. They actually work. Wow. I mean, there were all sorts of suppression pads that you paid a lot of money for and they didn't work. <laughs> but yeah, vibration suppression pads actually work. Perfect. You can see the, the little orange. Uh, the yeah. orange is like a uh, real soft material that absorbs a vibration. Okay, good uh, to know. With my old C8, when I looked at Saturn, I'd have to adjust the focus, then move my hand away and mm -hmm. see if I had it focused right or not. Because... You always introduce vibration when you adjust the focus. Yeah. And with the vibration suppression pads, I was able to focus right on and none of this, you know, having to wait for the thing to settle down. Mm -hmm. So they actually work. Nice. In fact, they work so well that I believe Celestron bought the patent from the guy that was originally selling them. Either it was Celestron or Orion. One of the guys came in and swooped in and bought up the patent and doubled the price. Yeah, they look like they're 50 bucks for them. They used to be 30 bucks. Ah, uh, well. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, these guys bought up the patent because it, it was the first vibration suppression pads that actually worked. That actually work. 
Okay, well that's good. Thank you so much. I'm going to look into that later because that is a problem. Definitely, that is constantly uh, up. Uh, Brian, do you have more questions that you would like to share? I think that we have answered really everything that I've has answered. come okay. up. Okay, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and close it out. I know we've had a great one. Oh, oh um, we've had a great session. Wait, before you close the window, a uh, couple of dates that are coming up, put it on your calendar. So we have stargazing. The next session we'll be doing this. Um, oh, hang on. I got like three thoughts all at the same time. Sorry, swoosh. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, uh, two quick things. Go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll get notifications when we do our next stargazing, which is October 17th. And also let Kent know in the comments how much you enjoyed it and what specifically you really enjoyed the most for tonight. We actually copy and paste all those and send him a huge old email. So if you want to let him know anything about tonight, how much you enjoyed it, thank you so much, anything like that, just let him know. That way he will get that in an email from us. And so he does this completely free of charge. He just loves to share his passion with the sky, uh, the night sky with the public. And so this is one of his ways he can do that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. Um, so uh, the next stargazing is uh, tentatively scheduled because we technically, uh, Brian, we haven't asked Kent if he's available. Oh yeah, October that's 17th. true. That would be a good thing to do. <laughs> so we'll do that offline, but but pencil it in, and Kent will uh, we'll figure out if you're available. <laughs> and the next member hangout is actually in a couple of days. It's September twenty fourth. So if you are a member of the Central Coast Astronomical Society, then, <laughs> um, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, and so if you're a member of the Central Coast Astronomical Society, or if you'd like to be a member, you can be a member tonight. It's $20 for the entire year. Um, you can go to our website, centralcoastastronomy.org. We are having a members only hangout where all the members get together and it's a giant Zoom call and they actually just get to talk, ask questions. Hey, look what I photographed last night. and <laughs> I can't get this thing to work, help. And so, so it's a really cool opportunity for people to just connect that just love the night sky. And you could be from anywhere in the world. And so we oh, Aurora? Them. Yes. I got a question for you. Yes. I don't know if it's been mentioned or not. Have we ever talked about uh, subscribing to either Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazines? Because yes. those are the, the two tops. And, you know, uh, they're excellent sources of information and also to get you interested. And yes. so I was, I was curious if we'd ever brought that up on our talk. I don't think I ever have. So, okay, here, Sky and Telescope magazine. As a member of CCAS, you get a discount on these magazines. And so that's not something I think I've ever mentioned. It's usually like, oh, by the way, we'll save you money. Um, so Sky and Telescope as is one of them as so is astronomy magazine yeah, astron I, I subscribe to both to of both. them to tell yes. you the truth yes i do too i have both of them and so they have star charts that oh look they're trying to sell me something okay so they have star charts inside you can subscribe to these on your own um you just hit the subscribe button these are great and they come out monthly and they will keep you hopping as to what you should be looking at and they come out a few months in advance so you have time to look up what you want to know about in there so yes, and they come in in um, online versions as well. The thing I was showing you tonight was my online version that I have. Um, this is the actual magazine. You can see it here that we're flipping through pages. And so it's a great resource. So if you are remotely interested in astronomy, you should be subscribing to them as well. And so if you're a member of our club, we also offer discounts for those. Um, and so the, the information's on our website. You can check that out. So thank you for that recommendation. Oh, and uh, the pens is the other question. Ha ha ha. I actually didn't open mine yet. <laughs> so thank you, Glenn. I just got it in the mail. And so Glenn is one of our members for Central Coast Astronomy. And he is hand making astronomy pens. Ooh, this is gorgeous, Glenn. Nice job. Um, and so he is hand making these pens. And so I just bought mine that's amazing nice job um if you are also interested in he does have some availability left and so um you would arrange with him to do that and the easiest way is to go to centralcoastastronomy.org slash p-e-n or if you just go to dot org centralcoastastronomy.org go down to where you see some pens and uh, you can find out more about that about how he's doing that and so all the um Proceeds go back into the club itself. He's actually just doing that as a thank you for the club. 
So this is something that you can look up as well. So thank you. Um, you put the pen link in the chat. Oh, thank you. That was awesome. You're welcome. Okay, and so you can find out more about how he's doing that and pick out the colors. And it's a fantastic gift for somebody who loves astronomy. And uh, my husband doesn't know this, but he is going to get this. This is for him. His birthday is coming up very soon. So, shh, don't tell. Okay, uh, <laughs> other questions. <laughs> other questions. Um, other book recommendations. Um, if you look on our website, we have a bunch of recommendations for equipment and all that sort of thing. So just go to centralcoastastronomy.org. Um, other questions. I have another question. You didn't answer it. Okay, if you didn't get a specific answer to your question, please just email us questions at centralcoastastronomy.org and we are happy to answer your questions individually okay so go ahead and just type that in all right kent thank you so much for being with us tonight uh you've been my coach and mentor and guide for 15 years <laughs> so, it's been a while <laughs> it's been a while so gosh I, I can't thank you enough um i used to park my little telescope right next to him and and just listen to what he was saying and just absorb and soak it in. And, and when I was stuck, I'd be like, Kent. <laughs> so it, he's just always so happy to help. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for sharing your love. Well, thank you very guys. much. It's been fun. So thank I'll you, I'll let Ken. you we go will see you now. next time. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right, Brian, we got to thank you for you too. Where are you? Right. <laughs> so thank you, Brian, so much. Yay. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> for helping yeah. with all the, um, the questions that I know you got pummeled with. Um, thank you again. So go ahead and drop uh, Kent or uh, Brian or both. Uh, thank you in the, uh, the chat box as well. And so thank you all for being here tonight. I will see you next time. The next stargazing again is October 17th. We'll make sure Kent's available. And um, <laughs> the next hangout for Central Coast Astronomy is on the uh, next Thursday, the 24th of September. Your Zoom camera just turned off. Oh, yes, that can happen. Okay, so I'm still live, though, so I think I'm okay. And we're about to go off the air. Yes, okay, so if you do have questions, let us know. Questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. Go ahead and enjoy your night. Get out there, get your binoculars, or just take your own naked eyeballs outside and check it out and look up and see if you can find the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the Great Square of Pegasus, all those things we talked about. This is yours. This information is good for at least a couple more months. And so start now and just start small. Just start with something, try one new thing each night and step yourself through it. All right, thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful night and I will see you at the next Stargazing event. Take care, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>